Please do hand it to one of the ushers as they walk through, and we will put you on the list. Um, I didn't say before I introduce this is we will have um, in this next month voting on new elders and constitution, and we really want as many of our our people that participate every week already to sign up so you can also participate in the voting. So we'll have two more weeks of opportunity to sign up if you didn't do it this morning. And thank you very much. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, but first we just want to pray again for the service this morning that you would um, bless um, Pastor Ryan as he preaches, Lord, that you would anoint him. Uh, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our ears. And Lord, we pray, Father, for um, our approval as a church for registration with the government. Lord, that we would have favor with them, Lord. And that you would bless the government leaders, that you give them great wisdom. And Lord, we pray, Father, that you would also um, raise up more Kids Quest teachers and assistants, Lord. That we would have uh, people that have a real desire to see our children know you personally, Lord. And we do pray that you would continue to work on our kids, that they would come to know you in a personal way, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would um, also bless our, our Alpha ministry, and that you would reach into the expat community, Lord. Lord, that you would help us to share the gospel in this broader expat community. And we pray for a spiritual awakening in all the churches here in Hanoi, and that you would bless, Lord, all the pastors that are preaching this morning, that you would protect them and bless them, Lord. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to give us unity as your body, Lord both within the expats and the national communities. Lord, that you would give a, there would be a unity in your church, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And we pray, Father, for Pastor Jakob and Linda as they attend the MACN conference. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time that as 200 international church pastors and their spouses gather, Lord, that there would be just a real word for them in this time as they support each other, encourage one another, and equip um, each other to be effective in their international cities. I pray, Father, that you would also um, minister to all the families uh, who lost um, loved ones in the blast in Sri Lanka, Lord, that you bring comfort and provision, Lord God. Lord, that you continue to help the government there to bring peace. We thank you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would also um, just continue to minister to um, and bless our finances, Lord, that you would help us uh, to continue to see your provision, but you would also um, bless um, this last week, Lord, uh, uh, forgiving, and, and we just praise you, Lord, for your incredible provision that you've always done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. So I get to start a new series on Philippians, and it's titled Joy in Gospel Partnership. Um, but first of all, I just want to thank again our YWAM teams. We have three different teams here. Can we just all clap for them one more time? Uh, it's kind of like YWAM Church Day, I think. We had like our two YWAMers on the screen uh, sharing their stories and having teams here. Uh, it's just so cool to see uh, the youth serving God around the world. So, Philippians. Now, I grew up in a Christian church. My dad was a pastor. And Philippians is one of these books that's very unique. There are so many famous little Bible verses that we plaster on shirts. Uh, Philippians 1.21, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Sometimes these get a little too cheesy. Um, so we put them on shirts, we put them on mugs. Don't us Christians love mugs? <laughs> right? We put verses on mugs. Um, and one of the most famous verses in the Bible is Philippians 4.13. Um, probably second to John 3.16. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And we put it on rocks, 
keychains, uh, necklaces, um, rings. This is a coaster that you put our favorite mugs on. Um, and then this one I really love, another mug, but they got it wrong. It's Philippians 3.14 on the bottom instead of the other way around, 4.13. Um, but I just think, and if you really want it to stick, just tattoo it on your arm, and then it will be there forever. Uh, but I think it's uh, kind of reflective of this book of Philippians, that it's this unique book, and it's one of the only books of the Bible, actually the only book of the Bible that Paul writes that he's not trying to correct or to change something in a church. And he's really connected to the church in Philippi. But, like, I have this, the question we're going to ask this morning is this, joy and gospel partnership. What does that even mean? What is this joy and it's in this gospel? What does the gospel look like and what is the partnership all wrapped around this? So this morning we're going to look at um, the beginning of the story. But with joy, let's define joy a little bit. We've all experienced this. There are joy givers and there are joy drainers. And so we've all been around people that are exciting, that are full of joy, that it's attractive to hang out with them, to be with them, and it almost seems like their energy and excitement and joy spreads out to the whole group. But we also know people that are negative, that something's wrong with something all the time, and it's joyless, there's no joy in it. And doesn't it seem like their attitude kind of spreads out to the whole group that they're in? And so this morning, I want to ask, what type of people are we? Are we joy givers? Are we joy drainers? Or there's a third option, do we just kind of go with the flow? For me, and a lot of us, doesn't joy often have to do with our circumstances, how things are going around us. Like if I'm at a party with friends, boom, my joy is really high. Or if I'm studying for an exam at a study group, my joy is like pretty low. Or the day-to-day -day office work, you're um, maybe going to meetings and doing your work, you're just kind of going with the flow and whoever's the most high joy level, you follow them. Or if there's a big negative person, you kind of follow that. But this morning we're going to look at joy when it really stands out. Now how can someone who has cancer still have this joy? Their world around them is falling apart, their body is falling apart, but they still have this deep-rooted, stable, consistent joy. And I, I've seen that. How can they have that joy? What about people that don't even know where their next meal is going to come. That the, there's these parents that have children and they can't even provide food for them and they haven't eaten all day, but they still have joy. Have you ever met someone like that? What about joy and tragedy? In the States, I've had friends um, and have had friends die in car crashes because someone was a drunk driver and they, they were drinking and they crashed cars and my friend died. But how can my friend's mom still have this joy and this deep-rooted peace as there's waves going everywhere and she can still forgive that person? How can we have this deep-rooted joy that stands out no matter what circumstances are around us. And this joy, don't you want this joy? Like, I want that joy. That it's not just on my circumstances, but it's something that's deep-rooted no matter what's going on around me. So this morning we're going to look at Paul, and he's writing this letter to the Church of Philippi. And he has this deep-rooted joy, even though he's on death row. He's in prison waiting to hear his execution is a yay or nay. 
So he's waiting to hear, maybe this is my last day. Are they going to come in and tell me, all right, lay down, put your head on the chopping block. This is it. This is your last day, your last few breaths. How can you have joy in this situation? And like I said, this is a unique letter to the Philippians. But how is our joy, if we had a meter, where would our joy be? Often it changes from low to high. It moves around throughout the day, throughout the week. But God calls us to be people of joy. And, and the pastor said this um, about Christian maturity. Because a lot of experts and scholars think this book, the Philippians, is a book to mature believers. And maybe we should say maturing believers, because we're always maturing and growing. And the whole topic is about joy. So a pastor said this, your Christian maturity can be measured on how fast your joy fades in difficult times. So your Christian maturity can be measured on how fast your joy fades in difficult situations, in difficult times. If your joy fades very quickly, we're probably not very mature in our faith. If our joy is strong and stays through the ups and the downs, that is a, a signal that we are mature believers. And that's what we all want to strive for. So let's dive into Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge, in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So we see that this joy is rooted in something. So Paul has this joy that is rooted in this partnership in the gospel. And so, again, we come to the question, what really does this gospel play out? What does it look like? And it is God moving and, and reaching out and, and changing lives and going after people. That is what the gospel is. And he says at the end, from the first day until now. So he has this partnership with this church in Philippi, and we're going to go back to the beginning, to the start. Now, I love beginnings. I love the potential, the untapped, the, the uncertainty of what could be. I think of the Olympics, the sports. So many people at the beginning, there's the opening ceremonies, and everyone has a dream of winning gold. It's exciting. The, the room is buzzing. Or the opening of a play or a movie and the lights dim and it's about to begin. So today we're going to look at the power of the gospel when the church of Philippi began. And it started in Acts 16. And it all started with God, by God. So Acts 16 it says, there was a vision that appeared to Paul at night. A man in Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought out to go to Macedonia. 
concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul and Silas and Luke, they were trying to go to Asia, and they couldn't get there. There was barrier after barrier, and God gave Paul this vision. I want you to go to Macedonia. I want you to go to Greece, this area, and tell them about me. So it started with God. Now this is important because when God starts things, when we have an ear to listen to what God is doing and follow him, we can expect big, big things. When, when God speaks and leads, big things will happen. And so we start with the story of Lydia. And so Paul has joy because he has seen the gospel, the power of God, work out through Lydia's story. And, and it says in Acts 16, And on the Sabbath day we went outside to the gates to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. Okay, so Lydia, she is Asian. She's living in Greece. She's from Thyatira, and she is rich. She is this Type A personality, get things done, business woman. And she's the seller of purple cloth. So she's in the fashion business. And she um, has, later on, she has this house. So she probably has a house um, in Philippi, probably has another house back um, in Thyatira. It would be like a business woman from Korea that is here working in Hanoi, has this huge apartment here that is so nice and also has a home in Korea. And so Lydia is rich, a businesswoman, type A personality, and it also says she is a worshiper of God. So she is seeking out God. And this worshiper of God, she would be seeking out God. She would have said no to um, the, the multiple God religions um, and just seeking one God and learning about this Jewish God. And she's seek, seeking. She doesn't know fully who Jesus is. And so Paul and his group kind of crash into this woman's Bible study. They have this woman's prayer meeting, and Paul crashes it and starts telling her about Jesus. So we see next the power of the gospel, how God goes after Lydia. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So it says, she is an intellect, she is smart, she's a businesswoman, and how does God go after her? with the mind, with hearing good arguments from Paul, hearing the truth from Paul, with the intellect. And not only that, she is baptized. Her life is changed. And then for Paul and Silas, it's probably pretty sweet. She's like, oh, come stay at my huge house. I'm like, oh, okay. So they go and stay with her, and they start this church, this community, this group. So the church starts with Lydia. And it starts with her intellect. She, she, she needed to learn through her mind. And next is a story about the slave girl. Right after this, we hear this story of how Paul and Silas continue to meet, and there's this distraction. So the slave girl, as we were going to the place of prayer, so they were meeting with Lydia and the women more and more. We were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. So this girl is probably a teenager. She's a slave. She's demon-possessed and can fortune tell. And 
has brought much money to her owners. Now, don't get confused here. She is actually being very annoying. She is being very disrespectful following these men and yelling this out. She would be yelling it out like, don't listen to these guys. They're trying to share salvation, but they don't know what they're talking about. She'd be screaming and yelling, and people wouldn't want to be around her. She was being a distraction. Now, this slave girl was completely opposite of Lydia. Where Lydia is an intellect, the slave girl would be not. She'd be more emotional or connectedness or experiential connectedness. Where Lydia is rich, the slave girl is very poor. Where Lydia is Asian, the slave girl would have been Greek. So there's so many different differences between these two women. But now we get to see the power of the gospel. Now how does God go after the slave girl? He uses Paul. And I, okay, I love this. Paul, having become greatly annoyed. It's okay to get annoyed sometimes if you're annoyed at the right things. Um, so he got annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owner saw that her ho their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. So did you see how God went after this girl? He went after with this Holy Spirit power. With this experiential power that she was in bondage. And you know what wouldn't have worked? Going after her with the intellect. If Paul went up to her and said, you know, slave girl, um, you're in bondage. Maybe you should try to get out of that. And um, you're demon possessed. That's probably not a good thing. Uh, maybe you should try to get an honest job and start working and saving money for yourself. That wouldn't have worked. So God used his Holy Spirit power to meet her where she is at. And this is the, the, the gospel, the power of God that brings so much joy to Paul. It was through this act of power. So there's, there's Lydia, there's the slave girl. Completely different, but God, the same gospel has transformed both of their lives. But there is still more. So it continues on, and... When they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men who are Jews have been disrupting our city. And they advocate that our customs are not lawful for us Roman citizens to practice and to do. So do you see what they're doing? They're pulling the race card. They're saying, These Jews are disrupting us Romans. These foreigners, these Jews are ruining our system. And so they end up getting thrown into prison. And then we come to meet the jailer. What can we learn about this guy? How is God going to go after him? And so we read his story. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison. So Paul, Silas, and Luke, they threw into prison. And they ordered the jailer to keep them safely. Having, having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet into stocks. So a couple things to bring out of this. So the jailer was commanded to keep these prisoners safe. And he was keeping them safe, but he also upped the pain. And it says they put them into the inner prison and put stocks on them. Now, lots of us, several of us might think that stocks are um, like, you know, they just lock around your feet and you just sit there and they keep you chained to the wall. Or kind of the New England um, East Coast where you have your arms in and your head in and you're just stuck like this standing. But the stocks in the Roman Empire were quite different. They were actually used to torture people. So they would have had stocks, and what they do, they, they would twist their bodies into all these different positions and keep them there for days. So their muscles would spasm and tighten up, and there'd be so much pain. So this is what the jailer did. He didn't only not listen and just didn't just keep them safe, but he added up and pained them with putting them into the stocks. 
And so about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul and Silas are probably two of the most annoying people in the world. They're in prison, they're being tortured, and what do they do? They sing hymns to God, they sing songs to God so other people can hear them and so they can praise God. I mean, later on, like, I don't know how annoying Paul must have been to these people. Like, oh, Paul, we're going to kill you. To die is gain. Okay, uh, Paul, we'll just kind of let you go. To live is Christ. And like, okay, well, we'll torture you. There's no suffering compared to Jesus Christ. This is an honor to be suffered with God. Like, you can't get around this guy. He is so focused on the gospel. He has this crazy perspective. And so they're there singing, and suddenly there's this great earthquake. So the foundation of the prisons were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he withdrew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. So who is this jailer? He's different from Lydia. He's different from the slave girl. This jailer is like a blue-collared, hard-working, like indifferent, I just want to work hard, be good in the system, go home, drink a beer, and watch the football match. Like, that's all he wants. He just wants to fit in, do a good job with his responsibilities, and enjoy life. He is very duty-bound. He likes the rules. He likes following them. He thinks everyone should follow the rules. Now, another thing is, in the Roman Empire, if a prisoner escaped, the jailer would be put to death or have to face that prisoner's um, order of execution. And so this jailer is so duty-bound that there's this earthquake. All the doors are open. The chains are gone. And he's like, everyone probably escaped. I'm just going to do it myself. And about to kill himself. Now, a lot of times, the jailers would either run away or they would be forgiven. But not this guy. He was duty-bound. He followed the rules. There was this kingdom that he was loyal to, the Roman Empire. Now, how does God go after him? He uses Paul again. And Paul cried out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. So Paul is actually a Roman citizen. And he knows in his mind, this guy, he just tortured us when they told, told him to keep us just safely. We could get back at him. If we escape, basically, we're killing this jailer. We can get him back. We can kill him. We have our opening. Our chains are off. The doors are open. We can run out, and this jailer will be killed. But what does he do? He yells at the jailer, don't harm yourself. And the jailer called for the lights, rushed in, trembling with fear, and fell down before Peter and Silas. And he brought them out, saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. So how does God go after the jailer? By, by using Paul and Silas as an example, that there's, there's this higher calling than being a Roman citizen, than serving the Roman Empire. There's this higher calling, and it's called God's kingdom, God's empire, his kingdom. That's who we serve. And this jailer got that. There's this example and so we see this huge contrast. This is the beginning of the church. And we see how the power of the gospel can break barriers. So look at their economic standing, these three. Lydia was rich, the slave girl poor, the jailer was middle class. They were different ethnicities, Asian, Greek, Roman. Their personality types were completely different. Lydia was a businesswoman, type A, intellectual. The slave girl would have been an experiential, emotional, connected person. The jailer is just duty-bound. I follow the rules, and that's what everyone should do. But look at, even at their stances towards God, 
Lydia is a seeker. She was seeking after God. The slave girl was completely opposed. She was yelling and trying to distract them. And the jailer was indifferent. And now look how the power of the gospel is shared to each one. So God goes after people where they're at. So he uses Paul in all of these to get to Lydia through the intellectual, through conversation. He gets to the slave girl through this Holy Spirit power of getting this demon put out of her. He goes after the jailer through the example of living a life of duty that is higher for God's kingdom. Now, this is amazing. This is the power of the gospel. This is why Paul has so much joy. He says, I have joy because of this gospel partnership with you. And we see something else. So, so this gospel power can break through any social barriers, any economic barriers, any race barriers, any personality barriers. This gospel is powerful enough to break through any of those walls. But the gospel does way more than just that. It does more than just breaking through. It brings unity. So get this, Lydia would have never been seen with a slave girl. The jailer would have very much disdained and disliked Lydia. The slave girl was on her own. She wouldn't want to be with either one of them. But the gospel breaks through these barriers and brings unity. It breaks through race and brings unity. Just look around this room. How many countries do we have represented here? And we're all here, and we have this unity together. Why? Because of the gospel. Because of Jesus dying on the cross and that power. And so, this is the beginning of the church of Philippi. And, and Paul has joy because of this power. He's, he was there at the beginning. And now he's writing back to the church. So let me read Philippians 1 again. So Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi. Paul knows these people. He's writing to them. That's, that's to Lydia. That's to this slave girl. That's to this jailer. He's writing to them and saying, together with the overseers and deacons, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, Lydia, every time I remember you, slave girl and jailer, and in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with this joy because I've seen this partnership with you in the gospel from the first day until now. And being confident in this gospel, in God's power, I'm confident that he who began a good work in you will continue it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul is writing, I, I am, I'm confident that God started this amazing thing in you with the power of the gospel, but it doesn't end there. It will continue for the rest of your lives. But I'm confident in that. And that he's continuing to work in you. Like, like when Paul is writing this to them, how old has the slave girl become? She's still a teenager? Has she worked through a, a lot of these relationship barriers that she's had? Is she married now? What about Lydia? What is she doing with all these finances that she has, that God has gifted her with? How is she advancing God's kingdom now when, when Paul is writing this to her? What about the jailer? I mean, he must have been kind of rough around the edges. Is he kind of softening up a little bit? Or is he, you know, kind of still rough around the edges? How is his heart softening and by the time Paul is writing this back to them, this, this continuation of the gospel power. And so this is the root that Paul has this joy in. And, and he continues saying, It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. Whether I'm in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, all of you share God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affections of Christ Jesus. Now this is amazing. Paul never says this to anyone else. I long for you with the affections of Christ Jesus. I love you guys. 
the, the, this affection of Christ Jesus is the same affection that led Jesus to the cross. The same affection that led Jesus to die for us. The same affections that made him come from heaven to earth to be merely a man. And Paul is saying, I have the same love for you. And then he says this prayer to Lydia, to the slave girl, to the jailer. And this is my prayer for you. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. So, how can Paul be on death row and still have this joy. Isn't it true that people who have joy think outside of themselves, think about others? The people that don't have joy, usually they only think about themselves and nothing past that. Paul has this joy because it is rooted in this gospel. He's seen it work. He has seen it transform Lydia, the slave girl, the jailer, and how it has transformed their lives, how the gospel is so powerful to break through any barrier. And the gospel has also power to unify this group. And his joy is in that. And he's, and he's so excited because he's a part of their stories. He was there at the beginning. And he says, even if I die tomorrow, I still have joy. Because what matters is the gospel. What matters is God's love going out. It doesn't matter if I'm doing it or not. What matters is God's love is going out. And God's love is going out through Lydia now, through the slave girl, through the jailer. It is being poured out through them. And that is why Paul has this deep joy even though he's on death row, he doesn't sh not sure if he's going to die or not. Wow. This is the type of joy that I want to grow in. Isn't this the joy that we all want to have? So this morning, let's take a moment to look at joy in our lives. If you had to rate yourself 1 to 10, 10 being super joyful like Paul, 1 being not joyful at all, where would you put yourself on the scale of 1 to 10? Our, our joy levels fluctuate, they change, so it might be different today than it might be tomorrow, that's okay. But joy can often be a pointer of how rooted we are in the gospel, how rooted we are in God, how rooted we are in a relationship with God. How would you describe your joy? Maybe have, more importantly, how would other people, your friends, your family, describe the joy in your lives? And then this is vital. What is your joy rooted in? What is your joy rooted in? You will not have joy that breaks through barriers, joy that breaks through storms if it's not rooted in the most powerful thing in the world, which is God and his gospel and his power to change life, alter lives, transform lives, to bring life. We need to be rooted in God. So maybe very simply, we need to go back to the beginning of our own lives. Some of us here are, are um, Christians following God. What was the beginning like? How did God go after you? How did God break through barriers to show his love to you? Maybe we have to go and think back on the beginning. Maybe we have to hear other, people, other people's stories. How did God go after you? Maybe at lunch today, ask someone, how did God go after you? Maybe you have to start the story. Maybe you don't know Jesus this morning. You can start this story. Maybe God wants to break through barriers in your life this morning. Maybe it's being aware and watching others encounter the power of God. Now, I have one of the coolest jobs in the world. I get to be here, I get to work with youth, international youth, I get to help with the Alpha program, and 
I get every Tuesday night, I get to help with the Alpha program and see people that are seeking, questioning, wondering about God. And, and last Tuesday, I was there and we were, we were doing worship. I just sitting there watching several people worship God. And these people, I know, have just come to know God for the first time within the last week, within the last month. And they were worshiping God and there is so much life and joy in them. And maybe we need to actually live out the gospel. Maybe challenge ourselves to step up and share even more with others. But first we have to be rooted in that and then live it out. This partnership in the gospel is what Paul is talking about, how we can have this joy by being together, worshiping here this morning, that we can have this joy by watching other people live out their faith, by watching other people be encountered by the gospel. And so Paul has this deep-rooted joy in the gospel that plays out through all these partnerships. So the question is, how can we experience this joy by being rooted in the gospel more and pray? Dear God, we thank you so much for today. Lord, we pray for your joy to abound more and more in our lives. Lord, that we would be, have our eyes fixed on you, the author and perfecter of our faith. And because of the shame that you had on the cross, and because you're seated at the right hand of the Father, we can come to you and focus on you. We just pray that our eyes would be on you, the distractions would fall away on the side. Lord, I pray for us here this morning that are dry, that, that don't have this connection with you. Lord, I pray that we would continue to seek you and that you would break through the barriers to us. Help us to encourage each other. Help us to think about and spend time in your word, in the gospel, and seeing the life-changing, life-giving, the life power that it has. So Lord, it's such an encouragement to start this series on Philippians with the backstory with the story of joy in the gospel. So Lord, continue to change our lives, make us more and more like you so we can love people in our families, at our work, in this community. So Lord, we love you and we continue to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I'd like to invite the YWAM team up. Um, and we are going to have a time of offering now, giving back to God. <clears throat> and it's the end of kind of our financial year at HIF, and we're a little behind financially, um, but we trust that God can provide, because God is so good, so powerful, and wants to do amazing things through us and in us. Um, so let me pray for our offering um, and then we can continue with worship through singing. So Lord, we pray for this offering that we give to you. Lord, thank you that you have given us life itself, that you actually give us all the money and finances that we have. You give us the joy itself, that you give us um, just our bodies and our health and roof over our heads. You give us everything is all yours. So Lord, I, I pray that you would put on our hearts to give back to you. And that through this, you can multiply it to have a greater impact here in this community, in this city. So, Lord, we, we do this as a worship to you, and we thank you for blessing us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's have our ushers come forward, um, lead an offering, and continue in worship.
Sing a little louder, my way. 
message, if God spoke to you through the message or the worship, we want to pray for you. We don't want you to leave before you're blessed. Um, we will have prayer partners up front um, so the prayer partners can come forward. Sometimes we think that only God can reach certain people or that the gospel is only powerful for certain personality types. Uh, but that's just not true. The gospel is for every single person, no matter who you are, where you come from. Um, so if you want prayer for anything, for more joy, um, to know who Jesus is more, we would love to pray with you. And let me leave you with the end of what Paul said to the Church of Philippi. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Well, have a wonderful week, um, and continue to praise God and worship Him uh, the rest of the week. Amen.